You're listening to the Bluffton Biblecast, a podcast designed to accompany and encourage you as you explore this year's Bible reading plan. Hi, I'm Blaine Ashleman, and I'm here with Lori Fichter and Corinne Kirshner with Hayden Craighead behind the microphones. This week, we are reading Genesis 32 through 35 and Luke 15, 11 through 32. We will be taking a look at Jacob being reunited with Esau, along with the story of the prodigal son. There were 20 years between the time Jacob left home and then headed back. 20 years bookended by angels, twice, all for Jacob. Everyone remembers Jacob's dream of angels ascending and descending that staircase to heaven. Jacob's reaction to that dream was, this is the house of God, and he named the place Bethel. Beth, or Bet, means house, and El is a word for God, showing up in names like Ishmael, Daniel, and Israel. That was the first group of angels Jacob saw. Recall that Jacob didn't leave home on a good note. In fact, his brother Esau pledged to kill him as soon as their father died. Even though 20 years had passed, Jacob was uneasy. After all, his mother Rebekah said she would send for him when Esau's anger had cooled. She never sent for him. Then Jacob sent a message ahead to Esau. But before Jacob received the reply, in Genesis 32, 1, it states rather succinctly, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. The Hebrew word used there for met can mean to fall upon like an enemy or to happen upon. Although I've read commentaries saying this is another dream, the text states that the angels met him, with no mention of a dream as before. What is Jacob's reaction to these angels? He proclaims, this is God's camp. So he calls the name of that place Mahanaim, which means double camp. The I am ending indicating the plural in Hebrew. Camp means an encampment or army camp. These were angel warriors. It reminds me of the prophet Elijah's situation in Second Kings 6 with that mountain full of horses and chariots of fire. These angels came as assurance to Jacob. He needed that assurance. When the messengers sent to Esau returned, they said that Esau was coming to meet Jacob along with 400 men. Genesis 32, 7 states that Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks, and the herds, and the camels, into two bands, thinking, if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. The Hebrew word used there for distressed is the first mention of yatsar. The literal meaning is to bind, to be in a tight place, cramped. Jacob felt penned in. To his credit, he prayed a heartfelt prayer, reminding God of his promises, confessing his own unworthiness, and begging to be saved from Esau. But then, true to form, he fell back on his own wits and strategies. Then Jacob sent ahead of him an extremely generous present in stages to soften up Esau. Or perhaps it was to show that he was independently wealthy and was not going to take any of Esau's inheritance or it was to pay off those 400 mercenaries. At any rate, it it was an impressive gift. According to the Culture Background Study Bible, this gift is larger than many towns would have been able to pay in tribute to conquering kings even at later dates. If Esau or his men had plunder on their mind, it saves them the trouble and makes the trip worth their time and effort. This night, the night before Jacob would face Esau, was a watershed moment in Jacob's life. Jacob purposefully isolated himself on the opposite side of the Jabbok River. He is left all alone with God. As David Guzik's commentary states, a man wrestled with him. As the following verses show, this was no mere man. This is another special appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament before his incarnation in Bethlehem. This was God in human form. The wrestling match could have ended at any time. All that God needed to do was to touch Jacob and instantly disable him. But there needed to be a struggle. Jacob needed to become so weakened that he would realize his strength depended solely on God. It reminds me of 2 Corinthians 12, 9, when Paul prayed three times to have his thorn in the flesh removed. But God tells him, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Jacob had a limp for the rest of his life to remind him of that truth. Then as morning dawned, Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. God did bless him and gave him the name Israel. Israel is a compound of two words, Sarah, meaning fight, struggle, or rule, and El. Israel was his new name, for he had striven with God and with men and had prevailed. However, he will still be referred to twice as often in Scripture as Jacob, 
than is Israel. As for the brothers' reunion, Esau is prevailed upon to accept the gift, and there seems to be a genuine reconciliation. But Jacob still hedged his bets. When Esau said he'll travel ahead of Jacob, or that he'll leave some of his men with him, Jacob begs off, and then indicates that he'll be heading that way at his own pace. But then he heads in the opposite direction. David Guzik phrases it like this. Jacob was glad to be reconciled with his brother, but didn't want to be too close to him. He was still afraid of Esau. Unfortunately, Jacob still acts like Jacob, because he's said he will go far to the south with Esau to the area of Mount Seir. Instead, he allowed Esau to go for a few days beyond him, and then headed towards the north to Succoth. It's hard to try to be Jacob and Israel at the same time. I love this thought of Jacob's name changing to Israel. As we discussed before with Abram changing to Abraham, names meant something back then. The name Jacob literally means heel holder or supplanter. Jacob was defined as a man who undermines and tries to usurp the ones above him, namely Esau. After the man wrestled with Jacob, he called him Israel, a man who prevails. But as pointed out by David Gusick, Jacob did not immediately accept this name as he continued to undermine Esau. Before we look at the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, I think we should cover some context, specifically who is the audience. In the beginning of chapter 15, it says, Then draw near unto him all the publican and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinner and eateth with them. And he, Jesus, spake this parable unto them. It says that Jesus could be speaking to the publicans and sinners, along with the Pharisees and scribes. Let's focus on the Pharisees and scribes and discuss their education. During this time in Israel, there were many different religious divisions in Judaism. The Pharisees and scribes held the knowledge and application of the scriptures paramount. According to Ray Vanderlaan, their entire education system revolved around the scriptures. Young boys had to memorize the entire Torah. If they did well at this, they would advance to memorizing the prophets and the writings. That seems really intense. And if at any point, the boy or young man did not have the desire or the ability to memorize and understand these scriptures, he would be reduced to learning a trade, normally his father's trade. And this was considered a reduction in society. If one passed these grades, they could be considered to become a scribe, Pharisee, and maybe even eventually a rabbi. We wanted to point this out because Jesus often refers to the Old Testament in ways that the scribes and Pharisees would recognize right away because they have God's word memorized. With this in mind, let's take a look at the parable of the prodigal son and compare it to Jacob's life. In both stories, we have a father, an older son, and a younger son. The younger son goes to his father and receives his blessing or inheritance. Not many days after, the younger son runs away. After being gone for a while, the son's friends turned away from him. The son then decides to return home to his family as a servant. According to Marty Solomon, though some of the specifics and circumstances were different in the two stories, there are enough similarities that the scribes and Pharisees would have picked up that Jesus was telling them a story like Jacob's. Until the ending, that is. The scribes and Pharisees would have anticipated that the older brother would have accepted the younger brother with open arms as Esau did, and that the younger brother would still be up to his quote-unquote old tricks. But Jesus goes on to say that it was the father that accepted the younger brother, and that there was true repentance. On top of that, Jesus said the older brother was even angry at the acceptance of the younger brother. With this comparison of the two stories, what might the scribes and Pharisees be thinking? They were the ones who passed all the tests and showed the desire and the ability to memorize and live by God's word. Their counterparts, the publicans and the sinner, ran away. Now that the publicans and sinners wanted to return and repent, it should be their position to accept the publicans and the sinners with open arms, as Esau did. Because they are, or were, unwilling, the father must step in with open arms and even scold them. As a scribe or Pharisee, this parable would have been a personal attack on their way of life. Jesus just told them that, despite all their work and ability, they are in the wrong. Jesus often flipped the script for what the scribes and Pharisees anticipated and expected. He didn't praise them for their accolades but scolded them for missing the weightier matters of the law. 
Does Jesus flip the script from what we might anticipate and expect? How should we react to the story of Jacob and Esau, along with the story of the prodigal son? We've enjoyed digging into God's Word together, and we pray that all of us can continue to gain more knowledge and wisdom as we wrestle through these stories. Thanks for tuning in to the Biblecast this week, and we look forward to the weeks to come.